In the most critical phase of the Ukraine, Russia's war, the war and diplomatic strategies of leader of Vladimir Putin are now seriously jeopardizing the borders of the Baltic states and the future of the Eastern European bloc. At the focal point of this danger is Belarus, which is nowadays the most important actor in Russia's war with Ukraine. Sparks are flying on the border between Belarus and Ukraine right now. While the Ukrainian army strengthens the Belarusian border, Russia continues to build up a military buildup in Belarus. In fact, Russia seems to be gradually squeezing Belarus while Ukrainian troops keep Belarus at the border. Lukashenko fears Putin's wrath of course, but being involved in the Ukraine war scares him even more because it does not dare confront the Western NATO. And the West's attitude towards Belarus in this regard will be very, according to the latest intelligence, information and documents, documents are emerging that Russia can seize Belarus by occupation in the next few years. While Belarus is stuck between the armies of Russia from the east, NATO and Poland from the west, and Ukraine from the south, there are many rumors that after Belarus allowed its territory to be used as a launch pad for the invading Russian army and the ongoing Russian rockets and drone attacks against Ukraine, Putin would be more directly involved in this war against. Doing so would link Lukashenko wealth more than Moscow and open his regime to further isolation and sanctions from the West. On the other hand, if a strong Russian air defense force were to be stationed permanently in Belarus, this would also change Poland's defense account as Russian Belarusian forces would be able to intercept missiles from Poland, from Belarusian soil. In line with all these data, it is clear that Russia's strategic goal is to maintain a permanent Russian military presence in LAR. This basically lays the groundwork for the realization of the remaining strategic goals of gaining political and economic control of the country. It also highlights the need for Russia to increase stability while besieging the military operation in Ukraine. That is above all the need for some protection from NATO countries. However, the Russian leader Lukashenko has always emphasized the independence of the country in the past, despite its closeness to Russia, especially in recent days. Contrary to all these plans of put, Lukashenko and Putin actually don't like each other very much. Both entered into a policy as if they were waiting for the other two. Despite tensions between the two leaders, Belarusian military installations have been used since the beginning of the war to fly Russian air sorties and launch Russian cruise missiles and drones into Ukraine. In this regard, the Ukrainian authorities are cautious about the possibility or inevitability of fighting the two invaders. Andrew Chernek, spokesman for the Ukrainian Military Intelligence Agency, GUR, stated that they understand that Belarus's efforts are to support Russia and avoid participating in the war, but they also know how much pressure Russia puts on. On the other hand, there were a few impressive incidents that indicated the desire of Belarus to remain neutral somewhat far from being an active participant in the massacre in Ukraine. In December 2022, a Ukrainian trying to intercept the Russian missile landed in Belarus. The incident did not cause any disruption to Belarusian state propaganda, which would otherwise have easily turned it into an excuse for aggression. Lukashenko even publicly thanked Ukraine for not succumbing to Western pressure for Ukraine to respond to LAR. After this striking statement, tension between Belarus and Russia gradually increased. Recently, an internal strategy document leaked from the Russian leader of Vladimir Putin's administration office, turned the world agenda upside down and caused the critical process to begin between the two countries. This document laid out detailed plan of how Russia planned to seize full control over neighboring Belarus over the next decade under the pretext of a union between the two countries. Further, the document outlines in detail the creeping annexation of an independent but a liberal European nation by political, economic, and military means by Russia which is in an active state of war in its attempt to conquer Ukraine with overwhelming force. According to the published document, Russia's ultimate goal is the establishment of the so-called Union State of Russia and Belarus by 2030 at the latest. The striking document emphasizes the provision of a coordinated foreign and defense policy and trade and economic cooperation of Belarusian laws with the laws of the Russian Federation on the basis of the priority of Russian interests and the predominant influence of the Russian Federation in the sociopolitical, commercial, and economic, scientific, and educational, cultural and information fields. This would remove all that was left the Belarus's domination and would demote a country the size of Kansas with a population of 9.3 million to the status of a Moscow satellite in agriculture industry, espionage or war. It will leave Belarus's at the mercy of the Kremlin's priority. The leaked document also out outlined how Russia's military presence in Belarus will expand to include a joint command system and Russian arms depots, such a development with deeply worry NATO members on Belarus's western. It would also pose a security threat to Belarus's European neighbors such as Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, which are members of NATO and the European Union. 
According to some observers, this strategy confirms something that has long been obvious and at times openly acknowledged by both Moscow and Minsk. According to Raina Sachs, the former head of the ESD Foreign Intelligence Service, in general, this document is no different from the fact that Russia will get what it wants from Belarus. Of course, Russia will take control of LAR. But the question is, does it do so at the expense of independence? It is quite surprising that this target will be extended until 2030, so why wait so long for Russia? In fact, the answer to this question is clearly revealed by the data on who wrote the document and what its content is according to a Western official who has the right knowledge of its construction. Authorship of the strategy document belongs to the presidency's cross-border cooperation directory. The lower part of the document came from the pen of Putin's presidential administration, which was established five years ago. The main task of this directorate, which is claimed to carry out its mission in a rather harmless way, is to maintain control over the neighboring countries of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova, which Russia sees within its sphere of influence, like all six countries in the directorate's mandate. Belarus was once part of the Soviet Union, but as Ukraine and the Baltic states gravitate towards Europe and Western-style democracy, Belarus has been ruled for three decades by a trusted Russian ally. A Russian President Alexander Lukashenko, often referred to as Europe's last dictator. Shenko won the presidency in 1994 and never gave up with a series of elections, none of which were considered free by international observe. Luck Chen's final election in 2020 was particularly gruesome when a mass protest movement took to the streets, accusing him of stealing. As a result, both the US and the EU no longer recognized Lukashenko as the legitimate president of Belarus Lukashenko. Opponents, including Tishkovsky, were exiled or imprisoned. The concept of the Russian and Belarusian Union state, on the other hand, was first introduced in the mid 90s In the form of a treaty designed to integrate Russia and Belarus politically, economically, and culturally, a federation modeled after this former Soviet Union was established in 1999 with its own governing institutions, including the cabinet parliament and supreme court. But the project failed and full implementation was not seriously discussed until 2018 which coincided with Putin's aggressive geopolitical ambitions. In November 2021, Lukashenko and Putin signed an agreement allowing for 28 integration programs focused mostly on economic and regulatory questions. They also signed a common military doctrine. The political aspect of merging the two countries were left out and while Ukraine's other neighbors were horrified by Moscow's brutal invasion last year, Lukashenko remained one of the few foreign geopolitical partners of increasingly isolated. Lukashenko political ties, however, became tighter as Russia's invasion of Ukraine was disrupted. Belarus has become a huge hurdle for Russian forces, which have recently been busy training newly mobilized Russian soldiers on Belarusian territory. The war in Ukraine clearly slowed the pace of the Kremlin's implementation of its plans in Belarus, but the war did not stop them in any way. The Western intelligence official stated that the long-term goal of achieving full control over Belarus is still in place and has not changed. He added that Russia continues to rely on its articulated strategy for the State of the Union and is still working towards it. He also stressed that Russia is aware that Belarus is trying to undermine these processes. And some of this is publicly visible, such as prolonging the political integration process. As a result, after all this, we will see together what kind of situations will arise between Russia and Belarus with the striking effect of the leaked document we mentioned. Next until today, start to become clearer after a year. After fierce clashes in Donbass, both sides have slowly turned their focus towards the Crimean Peninsula. In recent days, perhaps the center of resolution for every conflict in the war, Crimea, as you know, has been completely besieged in recent weeks due to the airstrikes of the Ukrainian army. In addition, the presence of Ukrainian partisans on the southern front lines of Ukraine and on the Crimean Peninsula was pushing the invading troops in these areas. Tensions in and around Crimea reached a peak after Ukrainian forces launched dozens of airstrikes on the peninsula with an army of drones. On the other hand, the Ukrainian partisans supported the Ukrainian armies inside Clement of the Peninsula from all. With active operational missions and intelligence work on the southern front lines of Melita Pole, Sepia, and Kaysan. With the increase in the possibility of possible attacks, the residents of the Crimea region were also having very restless days factors, such as the concentration of Ukrainian partisans on the peninsula. The latest situations in the southern front lines of Ukraine, which created the possibility of attacking Crimea, and the passive position of the Russian forces on the peninsula and its surrounding, in fact created a serious attack area for the Ukrainian army. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, preferred to concentrate these attack opportunities on the Crimean peninsula. 
In recent days, clashes in the peninsula flared up again as partisans in Crimea constantly shared in intelligence data of the occupation forces with Ukraine and Russian troops carried out sabotage actions on the military assets in Crimea. The other day, saboteurs blew up a railway line in the Crimea near Samfi. This striking attack seriously disrupted the railway communications on the territory of the peninsula. At the same time, it would seem by some miracle, the disastrous consequences were prevented because given the scale of the damage to the railroad tracks, any passing train would be guaranteed to be derailed. Currently, it is known that the explosion 12 kilometers from the Farrell station near the village of Pacha, Tov damaged part of the tracks. Traffic was stopped at the branch due to the damage. Three trains had to be delayed for several hours among the delayed trains. It is known that there are two suburban electric trains as well as the Petersburg train with capacity of 166 passengers from Sylvester Pole. It is not known where the military trains went in the direction of the explosion. However, considering that sabotage groups are operating in this region, the situation on the peninsula is quite dangerous as new attacks can be attempted. On the other hand, experts point out that the damage to the railway track contains very strange. The blowing up of the railway line between Crimea and Russia disrupts Russia's plans to invade southern Ukraine and cuts off the connection between Crimea and Russia. Partisans in Crimea always remind that Crimea is not Russia and that the Ukrainians are roaring to take it back. In addition to the broken burst damage on the rail, the rail has a fairly even cut. This in turn, increases the likelihood of looking for guaranteed damage to the railway line by approaching the saboteurs' attacks very carefully. So this striking sabotage action on the rail near Sam Pult seems pre. After this attack, the power of the partisans in Crimea was remembered once again, especially the Tartar and Ukrainian population on the peninsula paved the way for Kiev-backed initiatives. Currently, the recent attacks of Ukrainian partisans have made the Russian military units on the peninsula and regional officials very worried. This is because the probability of possible sudden explosions in attacks is. Of course, the Russian authorities on the peninsula also began to increase security measures in response to the attacks and sabotage actions of the Ukrainian partisans. The Russian invaders are trying to prevent these attacks with destructive measures in the temporarily occupied territory of Ukraine, especially in the Crimea. Russian special services were tasked with exposing Ukrainian resistance networks for these selective searches will be carried out in the apartments and houses of the Crimean people, especially on the representatives of the Crimea. These searches will start from the regions where the Crimean Tars reside. The so-called competent Russian authorities in Crimea say they will check basements and garages, phones and computers to find information that would indicate Russian cooperation with Ukrainian armed forces. As the Crime Center points out, such measures relate to the data that the Kremlin received from a closed sociological study of the sociopolitical situation on the peninsula. But the current sociological situation indicates that even those who previously supported the Russian Federation's large-scale invasion of Ukraine are now indifferent to supporting Moscow. These sociological conclusions also applied to the Russians who were settled in Crimea during the eight-year occupation. On the other hand, the Russian military political leadership fully realized with the recent partisan attacks that the Ukrainian partisans played an important role in the liberation of Kaysan from the Russian occupation forces. Therefore, they are trying to find new methods in the fight against the Ukrainian resistance movement. For this purpose, a yellow terror threat level has been set up in the temporarily occupied albeit in only some parts of the peninsula. However, despite all these measures, effective sabotage and offensive operations by Ukrainian partisans and Crimean Tartars in the peninsula continue. You may remember that recently Atash, the patent movement of Tartars and Ukrainians operating in the temporarily occupied Crimean Peninsula, eliminated two invaders Rogadia employees planned to spend a nice evening and were traveling from Sylvester Pole to Sim. But their plans were thwarted by an explosion thanks to a sabotage attempt by the Ukrainian partisan operation. The car with the Russian invaders was blown up using an explosive device. As a result of the explosion, both Russian military personnel with the rank of officer died. The Russian authorities, on the other hand, do not comment on the incident in order not to destabilize the region. But the Ukrainian partisan movement on the peninsula feels the moment of liberation and continues to grow with the aim of bringing victory for the Ukrainians closer. On the other hand, given the recent clashes on Ukraine's eastern and southern front lines, we can see more clearly that the cost of the war continues to rise. Peace talks have almost come to a standstill, and both sides have suffered staggering, casual, with tens of thousands of soldiers killed after the recent violent clashes in Crimea. Kiev expects Moscow to launch a new offensive in the spring. In preparation, President Vladimir Zelensky expects more aid, weapons and equipment from his Western allies. The war has already caused disastrous damage to many sections of society in Russia. In addition to troop losses and loss of weapons and equipment, large numbers of Russians left the country or announced their citizenship.
and there is a wider conflict with the international community. The economy has also been hit by Western sanctions. Most of the difficulties that the war brought to Russia are not immediate. But in the long run, even the Russians are aware that these difficulties will make themselves felt. At the top of these difficulties is the loss of soldiers of the Russian army. But there are questions about Moscow's war losses. The Kremlin has only acknowledged 5,937 military deaths in Ukraine so far. This figure contradicts the estimates of the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, which publishes daily updates on Facebook. According to the latest Ukrainian General Staff estimates published, it is stated that the Russian military casualties as of today are 150,850 soldiers. Ukrainians estimate it's closer to the number of dead and wounded soldiers, quoted by the Chief of Staff General Mark. Also, General Eric Christofferson reported that Russian losses were approaching about 180,000 dead or wounded soldiers. Chatham House expert Giles, on the other hand, described the casualty numbers on both sides as appalling. But Giles also stressed that the Russian casualties reached record numbers. It's actually difficult to discern accurately the number of casualties, but by all authoritative accounts, the number of Russian troop losses seem huge. This indicates that the Russian army will not be able to make an effective entry into the spring period. In fact, if the Russian army continues to wear out in this way, the predictions that the duration of the war will be shortened are too high to be underestimated.